And I thought I'd, I'd show you something that's a little bit unusual. And it's something that I noticed and then got excited about and researched. And you probably kind of know it in one way, but might not have thought of it in, in that way. So I hope it's interesting for you. And I'll talk for about maybe 30, 40 minutes, see how we go. And then we'll take questions and have a discussion and see where it goes. So here we go. Let me share, share this handout with you. And I will send it to the rabbi afterwards. So don't worry. And I've got a very troubling picture over there and the right there. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what it is later on. And I try to find the most troubling picture that I could. Uh, and we'll see what that is, that spit roast is later on. So this is called the Edible Haggadah. And as we all know, so many of our festivals are working around food, right? They try to destroy us, we survive, now let's eat. But there's something different, and there's a lot on Seder night and Pesach. There's a lot, matzah, maron, haloset, and the dipping and, the, and, and everything else. And uh, it's like other festivals, but there's a slight difference, and I'll tell you why. Nobody in the wilderness ate cheesecake on Shavuot. Nobody on Rosh Hashanah in the wilderness and Jewish people dipped apple in honey. And the Greeks or the Maccabees did not eat latkes on Hanukkah. These foods symbolize a historic memory of what happened of the story, but they're not part of the story. Does that make sense? Like hamantashen. Like Haman never ate hamantashen. There's a big debate what those really are. But there's, hamantashen is a food that came afterwards to recall the event. But there's, no, there's nothing in the story that has hamantashen in it. Do you understand? Pesach is different. The food is not symbolic in that it's actually in the story. Our ancestors in Egypt on the night before they left ate matzah. That's how, do you see how that's different? It's not a memory of the story, it's inside the story itself. So much so that in the Haggadah, as we know, look at this first source over here, we actually say this, we're gonna say this quite soon, sorry to scare you, that Pesach is so soon, but on the Saturday night, Ramon Gamliel Haya Omer, Ramon Gamliel used to say, remember this? Whoever's not explained these three things on Passover, um, if you don't mention these three things, you haven't done your Pesach. Pesach, Matzah, Umaro. And some people point to them as well. Some people don't point to them. Some people point to inappropriate things when they have them, right? But the idea is that the Pesach and Matzah Maro are words you have to say. It's like Sesame Street. You know, Pesach is brought to you by the words Pesach, Matzah, Maro. And if you don't say those words, you haven't done Seder night. That's how important these foods are. The question is, what's the relationship between food and freedom? Why is it that they ate that? Now, you might know that according to Christianity, um, the Last Supper of Jesus was actually possibly Seder night, and they call that the Last Supper. But that's the Christian view. The Jewish view is that this is the first supper. This is the first supper of our people. This is what binds us together as the Jewish people. That, not surprisingly, people getting around together for a meal to eat. So fair enough. But the question is, what is it about? What does it mean? What's going on here? And to explain it, I need to go through the text with you. We're going to learn this text. It's Exodus chapter 12. It's actually longer, but I've chosen verse 1 to 15 to analyze and explain what's going on and what we do at Seder night as well to explain the unique nature of the food of Pesach. To repeat, in other festivals, the food comes in afterwards as a symbolic memory. Pesach, the food's in the story. And the question is why and what are we doing? And the truth is, there are so many rituals and traditions about why you eat matzah and why you have haroset that it's really hard to sort out the, uh, the wood from the trees. So, you know, there's like, I know 20 reasons for matzah, I know eight, I know six, and there's later ones. And the truth is, it's all very nice, but there's a lot of later ones that were added as opposed to the primal ones that are in the text. And I want to show you what the primal ones are in the text and what the ideas are built upon and how that actually works. OK, so I'm not going to touch on every issue, but some of them will come in later on, as I would explain. So here we go. What am I talking about? Here we go. This is the famous bit. This is chapter 12. This brings us to we're in the middle of the plagues. We've just had the ninth plague and the tenth plague is about to happen. Before that happens, God speaks to Moses. By Om HaShem and Moshe, and God speaks to Moses and Aaron and says, in the Eretz in the land of Egypt, and says, and this is very famous. This is the beginning of counting the months. HaChodesh HaZeh Yelachem Rosh Chodashim. This is verse two. This month will be to you the first of the month. We're being taught to count time. It's the first for you, now the month of the year. Okay, and that's why Nisan is the first month. Now, that's famous. Everybody gets too excited about those verses. I don't want to go into those. I want to do the next bit. And here's the surprising thing. You all call it the Paschal Lamb. Have any of you ever thought of calling it the Paschal Goat? 
Sounds a bit weird. Why is he saying that? It's a Paschal lamb. Uh-uh, that's not true. Look what the Torah says. Verse 3. God says, speak to all of Israel. And then one tells them the following. But Esau Lachodesh on the 10th of the month. So let's be clear, okay? The, this, the, um, God spoke to Moses and Aaron on the 1st of Nisan, which was on, which was last Sunday, okay? Um, we're now two days in. We're on the uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're on the 4th of day in the evening now of, 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 um, of Nisan. So on the 10th of the month, he, he spoke to them on the 1st. This is where it starts. He says, he spoke to them on the 1st and says, they've got 10 days to do this on the 10th of the month, which is basically next week, next Tuesday. Azer, but who lachem ish, each man, so it's like each man of a household has to take a se, not a keves, not a, not, not a sheep, but a se. Now, what is a se? And I look up in your, when you get a chance, look up in your Chumash at home, how it translates a se. A se isn't a, a young kid. A se is a, is a group word for a young lamb or a young kid. How do I know? We'll read ahead and you'll see. Okay, so take a young uh, goat or a young sheep. That's a lamb or a kid. Levetavot, according to the household, um, selabait, one to each household. And there's a whole animal that's going to be eaten. So it's quite a lot. Right? You normally will get a cut of lamb. You probably don't have much goat at the moment. But if you've ever had your lamb or lamb chops, you're taking just cuts. But imagine a whole lamb and how many people that can feed. Um, and if there's less of you in your household, then join up with your neighbor to make sure you're all together and you can count that you can all eat one whole young sheep, one lamb or one goat. It should be a, um, an unblemished male, one year old, one year old. Um, and look what it says, for you, either from the sheep or the goats, you should take. That's how you know what the word se means. It's in other places in the Torah as well. But se is a collective word. Now, why is there a collective word for young lamb or, or kid, uh, a, a, young, a young goat or sheep? Because in that culture, often they were put together as you had a joint word for them. In modern English, we don't have it because agriculturally that doesn't work like that. I mean, we have a word cattle for different kinds of animals in that sense. OK, um, but here we're talking about a joint word for either a that. So that implies, by the way, that it's just as much a Paschal goat as a Paschal lamb. And if you couldn't afford a Paschal lamb, you get a Paschal goat just on the side. That makes Khadgarja have a whole different meaning. If you think about it. Right. We'll come back to that. Right. Because Khadgarja is all about one little goat. And the writer of it, I would argue, is relating back to this Paschal goat over here. And since he was a medieval guy in Europe and couldn't afford lamb, it's more likely he'd have a goat. But we'll come back to that maybe later on. Anyway, so that's what they had to get. They had to get together in the family. I want you to reimagine this. Now you're saying, well, by we don't eat this today. We dafka don't. We have chicken or a milchik, a veggie, a veggie seder. I don't know what you have. But and Ashkenazim get very nervous, you see. Ashkenazim are very nervous people. And they're very scared that if they somehow had any kind of lamb and it was maybe roasted, then it would give the wrong impression. And therefore you shouldn't do that because there's no temple. Sfardim and Yemenites, like myself, don't have that issue. They're much more comfortable about having roast lamb on Seder night, just so you know. Right? We know it's not um, uh, the same as an actual Korban Pesach or the actual Paschal lamb or goat because there's no temple. But Sfardim, if there's any amongst you, you can tell us what your traditions are, would, do, would still eat those kind of things. But Ashkenazim, if you're happy with your boiled chicken, then why am I, should I be someone to complain? Okay, anyway, we'll come back to it. So that's what they had to take. Now it gets interesting. I want you to understand this. So remember, this is the night before. This is a week, two weeks before they're going to leave. They're told to take this animal. You've got to get it on the tent. This animal. Organize your family to make sure there's enough enough people will complete uh, to feed the whole animal. To, the animal will feed the whole lot of you. And you've got to keep it from the tenth to the fourteenth of the month. And you've all got to um, shecht it, slaughter it in the afternoon, everyone in Israel. Now, this makes it unique. It's the only offering that was done. It's also outside the tabernacle, or the outside the temple, but it's the only offering that was done in the afternoon. All offerings were done in the morning and in the evening. Okay, the, in the actual evening. This is a very unusual time to do it. It's a very special kind of sacrifice. And you've got to take, as you well know, you all know the story, take the blood and put it. Sorry, I've got Paul coming through. Just I can't talk right now. Uh, take the blood and put it on the um, uh, on the door on the doorpost. You know this on the two doorposts. Um, uh, 
ala batim, on the lintel of the house, asheachlu oto, um, that you're going to eat it in. That's what you have to do, the famous blood on the doorpost, as you know. Now, this is the key verse, verse 8. Ba'achlu et habasa, ba'layla hazeh, and you shall eat this meat on that night, sli esh, roasted over fire, umatzot, with matzah, almim, on bitter herbs, yochluhu, you eat it all together. That is the tradition. That's where Pesach, Matzah, and Maro comes from. It's a verse directly in the Torah. What you do on Seder night by recalling and eating these things, and you might have it on your Seder plate, your shank bone, which is similar as well, possibly to it. Some people connect it with that way. And your Matzah and your Maro is this verse. You're reenacting what our ancestors did in Egypt. So it's not that you've got a food to symbolize something. You say, oh, the Matzah symbolizes something. No, no. The Matzah was what they ate, so you eat it. So you're not reenacting a symbol, you're not, you're not doing a symbol, you're reenacting an action that they actually did. I hope you see the difference there, it's kind of weird. And why are they getting all these culinary rules on the night they're about to leave Egypt? Quick, just get on with it, you know, what's the difference? That's what that tweets, we'll come back to that. And then look at all the strict rules, there are loads of rules about this. You mustn't have it a raw, or, or cooked in water, so it's like boiled, as it were. You mustn't do that. Kim Saliesh, it's got to be roasted. And not only that, Rosho al Kava'av the al Kibo, which means its head to its uh, to its uh, legs with its innards. In other words, the whole animal. That's why I suggested to you this picture of a spit roast. You don't cut it into bits, and even got the head over here. This is a, a sheep, uh, a lamb, a lamb roast, a whole lamb roast. You've got the head all the way to the legs and it's in, it's all roasted together. Now, the rabbis of the mission got really excited about this because they're saying, wait a second, it's all, we'll, we'll look at it in a minute. How does the roasting actually work? Which I'll show you in a minute. We'll get to that. But it's a whole animal. And the question is, why? Why did they have to do that? You know, why don't you say, get a quick meal and you're going to go? You know, the night before you go on a, on a, on a holiday, you don't do a big step up meal. And Erev Pesach, either you order in from the old days, or you might get a little meal, right, before you go, because you've got to organize Pesach. You don't start doing a big meal. What's this about the night before they left? So why are they, why, why are they doing this? And why in this way? Why all these special rules? You mustn't leave any of it in the morning. If there's anything left, you've got to burn it. The whole thing should be eaten. And if there's any leftovers, it should be burnt. And this is how you should eat it. Right? So you've got to be ready to go, shoes on, holding, holding your staff, right? Uh, holding your staff, and eat it in a rush. That's what I'm talking to you in a rush. Pesach Hashem. It's called a Pesach to God. And that's why I called it a, a Pesach. So that's your Pesach over here. That's your Matzah over here. And that's your Maror. All three, those are the top three. That's why Rabban Gamliel said, you've got to do Pesach Matzah Maror. That's what our ancestors did. Now, I know you know a lot of this, but you might not have realized that actually, you know, it's not just the matzah were called or the mawal were called the bitterness. We'll get into that in a minute. It, they, they ate it. They ate it. So we eat it. That's what we're doing. We're reenacting what they did. And then God said, I'll pass amongst all of Egypt. And I'll kill all the firstborn. I'll hit all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From man to beast. And all the gods of Egypt. I'll make judgments upon them. And I'm the real God says God. And then verse 13, this blood that you put on your houses, will be a sign. It's a sign for you. It's a sign for you. Um, that you're there. It's a sign for you that you're there. And I'll see the blood. And I'll pass over you. Hence the word Pesach. I'll pass over you, and you won't be any, and you won't have any um, destruction or plague when I pass over Egypt. Now it's weird. If the sign is for you, where do you put the sign? And the rabbis got really excited by this issue. And Rashi talks about it. If the sign is for you, then you should put the blood on the doorpost of your house on the inside. So you go to your front door on the inside, and you put blood on the doorpost on the left hand side of the door, and then on the lintel above it. So, but you say well, it's not on the outside, so God can't see it. Well, what do you think? The angel of death can't see through walls. So you're putting that sign up, and then the angel of death notices you and then passes by. Interesting. Verse 14. This day will be a memorial. You'll make a festival to God for all time. 
for your generations. That's us. That word in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, is referring to you and me in Belmont and Wilder and Finchley in two weeks' time. Chukat olam right? It's a, 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 a law forever to do it. Shivat yamim tochal matzot, matzot tochelu. Seven days you'll eat matzah, and then he goes on to the rules of, of Pesach and the seven days of Pesach. But that's the basic text. And can you see what the central issue is here? It's about what they ate that night, those three things together. And that, I will show you, is the heart of what Seder is all about. Now, I want to understand, why did God make them eat that? Why did they have to eat that? So let's go over, and I'll go through my notes and briefly explain this to you. And I hope you're following. I hope it's not too uh, complicated. So, as I told you already, a ser is a lamb or a kid, right? We'll look at Chad Gajah again in a minute when I explain the idea. Um, it's household based, all must be involved. So now this is interesting. When you came back from working really hard um, as slaves, you would feel disheartened, disconnected. And this is a way of getting you excited. OK, take this animal. You're all going to eat. It's a lot of money. <coughs> this quite difficult to get hold of. So you all have to invest in this together. It's in the afternoon, as I told you, unlike other not. And now we have that key verse. Pesach matzah omaro. The meat, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. And my question is, why these three? Why was God making us have them have these three? And I'm going to follow on this. So by Samson of Hirsch, and 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 uh, especially because it's Belmont, um, uh, Belmont lovers of Hirsch, right there, I know, um, and others as other commentaries as well. So now you'll say, well, the reason we have matzah is because we were in a rush when we left Egypt. What's the problem with that? God gave this law on the first of Nisan, two weeks before they left. They weren't rushed yet. As my father-in-law always used to say, I used to always say, my father-in-law, Dr. Anthony Nichols, is very organized. He should be allowed to eat bread on Pesach. You know why? Because if he'd been there, he would have planned ahead. When he said, Moses says two weeks time, we're going to leave, we're going to need sandwiches. And he would have made the bread well in advance. So it can't be that the matzah was because we're in a rush, because we knew it was coming. We were told what's going to happen that night. So, so it makes no sense to say we were in a rush. That's why there's no time for the matzah to rise, even though that is an idea later in the Torah. But at this point, that can't be the reason. So what's the reason for matzah? So these are things you might have heard, but I want to argue. So people would say, oh, because matzah is the bread of slaves. My problem is, so first of all, I'd say that all three are symbols of slavery. And I'll explain that to you. Before you ask, you say, but wait a second. If they're symbols of slavery, why do they have to do them? Because they are slaves. I don't need a symbol of slavery to remind me that I'm a slave. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's analyze what the three are. The standard commentaries on their initial reason is that each one is a symbol of slavery. Matzah is what slaves eat. Why? You make it quick. It's a quick meal and you're rushing in, you're rushing out. You don't have time to have your big meals. You don't have time for the bread to rise. It takes time and you need yeast and you need extra things. So you just do a flatbread and you eat it quickly. So it's the bread, it's the food of slaves. That's number one. Maro also is about the bitterness of slavery. God embittered their lives. It says in chapter one of Exodus 14, the same word as Maro. So that's clearly bitterness. And the Pesach is also about slavery. Why? And this is where you'll see the Chad Kajak comes in again. Pesach is the slave themselves. Right? All those laws about the Pesach, why it has to be a whole animal and roasted and roasted over spits. It's not lying in a pot, a bottle of water, of a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pot of water, right? It's not cooked like that. It's cooked, roasted on a spit. Why? And by the way, I know this because the Mishnah says so. It's on a spit. How do I know? Um, and I'll tell you why that means it's a slave in a minute. But look, it tells you how they did it. It's not, I'm not making this stuff up. Ketzad Shalemet HaPesach, Tzolimet HaPesach. How did they roast the Pesach? Mavim Shapud. Bring a shapud, right? A spit. You know shipudim in Israel? You get your shipudim, your, uh, your spit roasted lamb cubes or whatever. Um, so you take a shibud shell rimon, pomegranate wood. What does that mean? So pomegranates grow on trees. Trees have branches and bark. So you take it with the bark of that because it's a very, the reason why, by the way, it's a very involved gemara, but it's basically to do with the fact that it's very dry. Because if you took a wood, which had a lot of sap in it, it would make it liquid and it would mix with the meat and it wouldn't be pure roast. It would be partly boiled, if you think about it. The whole point is it has to be dry. So pomegranate wood, apparently, says the Gemara, is very dry wood. So you, it's probably quite a nice smell as well. I don't know. So you take pomegranate wood and what you do, right? Tochavo mitochpiv. You take a, a stick of pomegranate wood and you shove it in the mouth of the uh, goat or the lamb. Ad beit nekuvato, which means basically it's bum. 
its anus, you shove it through all the way to the end. And you put its legs and entrails inside it. So what it says, you cut off the legs and you cut and you cut all the entrails, whatever, and you shove them all inside it, which is a bit weird, right? Um, that's according to, now the reason he's saying that, it's such a weird phrase, is because the verse, when it says how to cook it, was kind of weird. It says, Sli esh rosho, its head, al kalav, on its um, legs and on its innards. It's kind of weird why I've translated to it for to its head al to as far as from top to bottom. So because of that weird translation, the, the weird Hebrew, um, that's the reason why you'll see I clearly um, uh, explained it like that. Rabbi Akiva said no, and we follow Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said no, kumin bishul huze. That would be wrong. If you put stuff inside it, it would be like cooking it because it would cook inside its juices. You want it all external so the flame roasts it the insides on the out. So what does it say? El atolim chutzalo. You expose, you suspend them outside. So what does that mean? I think you would take out all the entrails bits on the outside and also put them through the spit. Okay, and maybe its legs as well, and you'd all roast it. So everything got roasted. But the whole point is, it's the whole animal. Now this suggestion of uh, Samson Full Hirsch is brilliant. It says, imagine you are roasting that spit and turning it around. What does it remind you of? A whole body roasting and skin burning as a whole body with a head a legs and arms it's you it's you you're that slave whose whole body is roasting in the sun who is wholly um and also boiled would be inside a pot but you're hanging on a stick it's as if you're hanging your life is hanging in the balance you, that you are this is the status of a slave they have no power they have no grounding or solidity they're hanging they're roasting literally they're being roasted in the work that they do every day the turmoil of turning over and over again till eventually they drop and they die roasting as i said in the sun that's the image so that's what hirsch says so all three pesach matzah maror are images of slavery the pesach is the slave themselves the maror is the bitterness of it and the matzah is the slave bread so it, it all fits. Now, what about other interpretations? We'll come to those in a minute. But those are the three basing interpretations of why you have those three things. But the big question is, right? So that's what I've said. Thus, all three, Pesach and Matzamara, are pre-freedom, uh, the pre-freedom status. And they're all memories of that. Now, this makes sense for our annual reenactment. You know, we, three, you know, years later, when there was a temple, we could have our Pesach. Now we just have the Matzah and the Maror. But we um, reenacted every year. That makes sense why we would do that to be like them. But why did the Israelites do it? Hadn't they tasted slavery enough? They were living it. Why would I need to remind someone of what's going through? Like this going through, like why would I, you know, I'm living through a terrible time. Why do I need to be reminded of it in a way? So the answer is the following, I would suggest. A slave does not eat symbols of their slavery. They're too caught up in the slavery themselves. They're not externally conscious of the slavery. They're living through it. Only a free person has the mindset to do this. They have what's called critical distance. It's the difference between sometimes a child and an adult. A child is involved in a situation and can't see outside it. That's why they get afraid or nervous. Or other people sometimes in, in work can only see what's immediately in front of them and they can't see the big picture. They can't have what's called critical distance. They're experiencing it. Critical distance means that you're not bound by the experience that you're having. You can reflect upon it you can step out of that reality. You're not stuck inside it. That is an act of freedom. Thus the act of eating symbols of slavery on that night was the first act of freedom. So we were asking the slaves, don't be slaves. Imagine standing at a distance, what it is like to be a slave. And you can only do that from the point of view of someone who thinks they're going to be free. So for the last night, and this is if they truly believed they were going to leave, and many of them did, then on that last night when they're having this, they knew they were gonna leave. They didn't mind so much having it. And they were having it as it were for old time's sake, the matzah as we used to have, the bitterness that used to happen to us, the, the burning in the sun that will happen no more. That's what's going on here. So it's a really wild idea making people live memorably. It makes them realize you're gonna be beyond this. This will one day just be a memory. That's what they're saying to them. And that's what that, that's what it was. Uh, thus, the act of eating uh, uh, symbols of slavery on that night was the first act of freedom. I hope you followed that psychological idea. But that's my suggestion of what's going on in the Torah. And I'm going to expand on it in the last few minutes as well. And that's why, by the way, all three foods then become symbols of freedom. 
Because if we ate them to remember we were slaves, but we're eating them ironically because we're now free, then we can eat them to symbolize freedom. So that's why there's another layer of meanings where all three stand for freedom. How does matzah stand for freedom? Because now we introduce the idea that Torah says later that you're in a rush. You will be in a rush when you go and you'll do it in a rush. Not because you're not allowed to have bread because you're a poor slave, but because you're, we want you to be rushed to run out of there. And therefore, it's the, it's, it reminds you of your freedom that you were running out to go. So suddenly matzah now has a new reason of actually freedom. And Pesach is about freedom as well. Why? Because the Egyptians, and we know this from chapter eight, um, venerated sheep. Goats we don't know about, possibly as well, but they venerated sheep. And it was an act of defiant freedom. I found this lovely Chizkuni commentary, medieval commentator. You know what he said? He said, imagine you're cooking it. Richo, the smell of this roast. Have you ever had roast lamb? But imagine a whole roast lamb on a spit. It's an intense smell. Um, Richo, no def. The smell would waft. V'holech, um, um, and it would reach the nostrils of the Egyptians and they smell it. And for them, this is their, uh, some, they value. And they would know that you, the children of Israel, are eating at your tum, what they revere. Isn't that an amazing idea? So that shows, now you wouldn't do that if you weren't, if you were afraid of being controlled. But if you knew you were going to be free, and you weren't afraid of your enemies anymore, you didn't feel like a slave, you were free, then you would have the guts, which is what you roast, the guts to do that. And that's what's going on. So the smell would waft out of the houses, like even if it was another place, a huge smell of everyone's doing this. Can you imagine? This is like a big, but if you've ever been to Mamuna in Israel, you know what I'm talking about, it's like that. It's a huge smell. And the Egyptians would know. So it's a sign of our freedom. And the Maror, how can Maror be a sign of freedom? Well, this is our and you all know this is middle class Anglo Jews. What brings out the flavor of roasted meat? A little bit of garnish, a little bit of bitter, a bit of lamb sauce, bitter, you know, herb sauce, right? Or maror brings out the flavor. What was the bitterness of slavery, which is a very dark idea? The bitterness brings out taste. Suddenly, bitterness has a very positive idea. A little bit of bitter brings out the flavor, brings out the taste. And that's the more positive side. So that's the reason, there's so many reasons. All three, Pesach and are slavery, and also Pesach and are freedom, and they change meaning in the act of doing them. That's what's going on on Seder night. You see how complicated this stuff is? That's why it's not just a symbol. The food is not a symbol. The food is the act of becoming free itself. And that's why there's no leftovers. It's all got to go, because we're not going back to Egypt. This is it. There's no turning back. And it's a sign also, why is it a sign for you on the inside and on the outside? Because you made that choice to leave. When you put that blood on the doorpost, there's no going back. You've passed the point of no return. You've had that animal for a few days. The Egyptians have heard you doing it. They've smelled the food. There is no way out. The whole thing's got to go. And it's a memorial, as I said, because, and this is amazing, by the way, when it says it's a memorial for all time, God told Moses, tell the people in Egypt that their ancestors are going to keep the law. So imagine you're a slave and you're doing this one night and you're being told generations in the future, your ancestors, your descendants, not ancestors, your descendants are going to keep this law. Well, what does that mean? It means you're going to have descendants. At this point, you're thinking, I'll be happy to survive one day. But if you have that faith, if you are told that generations hence will recall this, then you will live more memorably. In other words, if I told you that in a hundred years time, people will talk about the coronavirus epidemic of 2020 and 2021 and, and read the diaries that were written, would it make you experience it differently? That's what's going on here. They were conscious of the future memory. So they were inside the story while remembering the story. That's what's so unusual about this. this. You know, imagine in the middle of an action movie where we pause, James Bond, and st stop, and James Bond turns around to the person and says, tell your grandchildren what we're doing today. Now, that, that never happens in the middle of a movie, it break it up. Not quite true, actually. Um, Tolkien, who had a great understanding of these things in Lord of the Rings, does that. There's a great moment where Sam Wise Gamgee turns to, turns to Frodo when he's nervous and says, you know, Frodo, one day they might write stories about us and they'll say, how did they keep going? What made them keep going? And Mr. Frodo, if they're going to remember us, maybe we need to keep going. And the belief in the future Memory is what caused him to have the ability to keep going then. Do you get this play of what's going on? You're doing it for what will be in the future. That is an act of freedom. That's a slavery letting go of the in the moment, can't think beyond the day. 
to someone who can think beyond time. That's why the text begins with counting time. We count time, you are free, you are not bound by any of these things, and you are ready to leave. You can now think outside of the box of slavery. And Jews have been thinking outside of the box ever since. So that's the idea. Let me do a couple more sources and we'll finish, uh, and, then, and, then, and then we'll finish. So that's why this issue of Pesach Matzamao is over and over again in the same. Look, I'll show you four times it comes up. Number one, the big three, Rabban Gamliel, as we say, he was the grandson of Helel, Pesach Matzamao, you point to all three of them, and you might point to the Paschal Lamb, you do it, you point to the Matz, and you point to the Mao, those three things. Then the Bracha, just before the second cup of wine, talks about having the Koba Pesach and eating all these things again one time in the future. Then the Hillel sandwich, remember? The Hillel original sandwich, or as I call it, the, uh, the, the Hillel Hillel, because sandwich is named after Lord yeah. Sandwich, and actually it was a Hillel, so it's the Hillel's Hillel. Uh, well, there's just silence, thank you. Um, is another retelling of Korban Pesach. The original was, he took Pesach, Matzah, and he put them all together. Now we just have Matzah, Mawah, because we only dip in Chasa, because you feel bad about it. You don't want the horrible flavour. But that's what he used to do. That Hillel was literally telling you, take all three and bite them as one. Even though they're set for mitzvah and they can be done independently, which is why we can still do it even though there's no Pesach. The idea was all three, because that is that biting in that moment of those three, of the meat and the maror and the matzah, is the moment that you are the, that, that you are reenacting that moment. And the fourth point, by the way, is that the original questions in the Mishnah, and I'm sure the other the Rav knows this, there were originally five questions. One of the questions when the temple stood was, We used to eat, on all the nights we'll eat meat roasted or marinated or cooked. Mm, I'm making you hungry. Roasted, marinated or cooked. It used to all be roasted. It all has to be roasted on that night. So four times in the Seder we highlight this issue. Now I want you to know that I keep... Um, uh, Pesach Sheni every year uh, for two reasons. Um, we call it Second Chance Seder. What I do is a month after on the Pesach Sheni, I invite friends around, as you put on Facebook, all those who are hungry come and eat because you can actually do it, right? And we don't do the whole Haggadah, we do bits of it. And we cook malawach and roasted lamb and really good bitter herbs or wasabi. And I'm telling you, it tastes amazing. And that we do it for that reason because it's a taste of malawach is like the kind of flatbreads they would have had, and a nice bit of big shoulder of roasted lamb, and uh, and your wasabi or your other your other bitter bitters, and you have it all together, and the flavors going together, and it tastes incredible, and you really understand what they were experiencing then. And that's why we do it as well to recall that because we don't do it Saturday night in that way because you don't have a temple, but this way as a recollection, I do that to remember that issue. So I want you to really appreciate what that was. I want you to imagine, I don't know if you ever had or been to a barbecue where they roasted an entire sheep, head and all, and it's a whole body roasted and the flavors and the smells and the experience of it. It, it makes so much more sense to believe that it's you if you, um, if you um, could see it in that way. So I had to try and bring it to life to you. So to finish off, one more point and then we're done. Freedom must be tasted. It is consumed and internalized. That's what makes it real. Eating isn't just a way of remembering. Eating is an act of internalizing. Literally, it goes inside you. And by the way, have you noticed that we digest ideas? And if you like my class, you say, I'm going to chew on Rabbi Zaram said. I'm not sure if I swallow what he said. You know, I'm not sure if it sits right with me. It, do it doesn't, doesn't sit well with me. Have you noticed all the metaphors for eating we have for gaining knowledge? Swallowing, chewing on, digesting. Why is that? Because concepts do not have their own language. They're borrowed terms. So I've got, how do I explain the, my ideas going into you? When you swallow them, they're going into your head. So in a way, you're consuming them. So that's why the metaphor for, idea, for gaining knowledge is often about eating, because it's the same image of something on the outside and it goes inside you. Why? Because f in food, you have a deep attachment to something. This, this food goes inside you. It becomes part of you. And surely, isn't that what you want for Jewish ideas? that you swallow them, that they go inside you, that they touch your heart and your soul. They become part of you. Food literally becomes part of you and gives you energy. So food is intimately linked with a deep attachment and hence God. You swallow these ideas, you chew on them, you make them part of you. When you eat, it becomes part of you. That's what commitment is all about. And I'll end with a cute quote from a Marie, a guy actually, Marie Antoine Carême, who was a French chef and one of the orig originators of haute cuisine. And he said the following, in my best French accent. 
No. When, when we no longer have good cooking in the world, we will have no literature, nor high and sharp intelligence, nor friendly gathering, nor social harmony. He believed that underlying food was social harmony, was intelligence and sharpness and literature, and it's all interconnected in the act of eating. That's what the edible Haggadah is all about. You're not just eating symbolic foods, you're reenacting eating as a way of gaining your freedom, of swallowing the ideas and reimagining them, reimagining them both as slavery and as freedom. So instead of food for thought, it's thought for food, if you follow that. Thank you very much. That was the ideas I wanted to share with you. Um, I hope that made some sense, a little bit unusual, I know, but um, I gave away three options and that was his choice, so uh, you can blame him. Um, that's the edible Haggadah that I was talking about and why Pesach is so different to every other festival. And I'm happy to take questions at this point if there's anything you want to ask or, or clarify um, to help make sense. Um, David said, has Akoma ever been, what, to a kosher restaurant? <laughs> there is cuisine in kosher restaurants. Go to Israel, please God will go. There is there is good good eating, it can be done, it can be done. Um, any do, questions do you, or comments? Do you yeah? think Chazal, or no, 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 maybe not Chazal, but do you think later, generations of Jewish rabbinic leaders felt that because food was such an essential part of this festival and that's why our minhagim our customs are so food centric when it comes to spot on spot on spot on the Pesach is the primal model of all other festivals and everything else Right, we connect to Zechelis of Mitzvah so much so. And you're absolutely right. The rabbi saw the model of food relating to freedom and to the experience, and therefore they associated foods. It could be, Rabbi Levine, just from the family getting together idea of it, right? Let's give them foods to get together and eat together. Absolutely, absolutely. I it's also why it's so with the manna, but, yeah. but I think so. I think so. Just trying to think of why Sukkot doesn't. Something to think about. I don't know. Well, it like, does. You have to eat in the sukkah. All the foods yeah, you eat. Nothing, nothing, sukkah, yeah. right? You have to do it. All your eating has to be to the sukkah. But the sukkah yeah. itself is a model of the Mishkan. That's another element of it. We can do that another time. Uh -huh. The sukkah is the model of the in between heaven and earth. I'll hold you to that. Um, so anyone else got, I nicked that. I, 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 I jumped in, but I was just thinking. No, no, feel free. Any other questions? Anyone else or got any questions? Or are you still chewing on this? You mentioned that. Digesting it. Go on. You mentioned Chad Gadiah. Oh, yes. So, Chad Gadja, you're the kid. You're the kid that was brought for two zizim, the two Luchon at Mount Sinai. They get eaten by the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Romans, right? The Romans of the water, right? What have the Romans done for us? Aqueducts, right? Each one is, I've got a whole shit on it, but each, uh, each Stumbo Chadja is another one that attacked us, ultimately to the angel of death, right? Which goes the way to modern times. So each time they're always trying to attack the little kid. The kid is us. Why? Now you say, well, that's a bit weird, but it's not. If you know that the Seh is a Gadi, then Chad Gadja is a little kid that the father, which is always God, bought for two tablets at Mount Sinai and wanted to keep, and then he got attacked. It makes perfect sense, because what's the first line? The cat eats the goat. Goats don't eat cats. Cats are this big, goats are this big. Doesn't work. Think about it. What's the order? The cat eats the goat. That doesn't happen. Right? But the reason why is the cat is the symbol of Egypt because of the mummified cats. That's what makes sense. Okay? But it's a whole other shit. But anyway, the Chad Gadja is really about the Paschal goat. Right? If you learn anything tonight, it's the, uh, the Paschal goat. You'll think differently. But that's straight out of the Torah. It's a real shock when you see it. But we always learn these things secondhand. When you read the actual verses, you see what it is. And if you were a poor medieval Jew, which the right of Chad Gadja was, you couldn't afford a sheep. You would have a, you would have a goat. No doubt about it. Um, other comments or questions? Rafi, Did the Egyptians it's... revere goats? Good question, Anne. We know we're not sure. We know they did sheep. I've got stories about that as well. The goat might have been because if you were poor and you couldn't afford a sheep, then you'll get a goat. And that's the reason why. So it's not the exact symbol. So sometimes the rabbi, the uh, Torah is not forcing you to have what you can't afford. That's why sacrifices, by the way, could be a, could be a bird or, a, or, or an animal. Because if you're poor, you would have a bird. Um, other comments? R Rafi. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Well, David, how are you? <laughs> Thank you as always. Welcome to Belmont. Welcome to Belmont. Thank you as always for bringing Ralph Hirsch. And actually, that that in itself is an incredible idea and incredible to think that he probably wrote that what 80, 90 years before the Shoah. That he, yeah. he you know, that idea. Yes. yes, that's true. That's true. But he got it straight from the Gemara. Once you've read Gemara Pesachim, you, you see it. Yeah. 
Yeah. The question I have is um, relates back to uh, what what was what was in verse eleven, I think, of the of the of the of the text. Yeah. Um, where it talks about the uh, it actually talks about the the, um, the 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 Pesach itself being eaten in haste. Yes. And it's an interesting dichotomy with verse four, where in verse four. It says, um, and if there aren't enough of you, you shall eat with your neighbors. So it's communal eating. If I'm not mistaken, you can help me here, that there's somewhere in either Mishnah or Gomorrah where there's, there's an idea that what the rabbis meant here was that there should be at least 10 adults eating, eating, eating the one seh. Um, but whether or not that's right, it's, there's, the dichotomy is between the idea that you get together communally to eat which ordinarily would be a, a slow social thing. But then in verse 11, it says the Pesach needs to be eaten quickly, which ties together. Well, that's, that's interesting. I, I kind of agree and disagree. I think I'm not sure about the 10. My understanding was it was meant to be not public communal, but it's private. You eat it in your home. Unlike all the other offerings, called by not, which are in the tabernacle, like this, you they ate in their home and in and and in, uh, in the Shlosh Regalim every year when the Jews would go to the temple in Jerusalem, they would eat it in Jerusalem, but they would eat it in family groupings. Yeah. I don't think necessarily in a minion. I don't know, maybe. I don't understand necessarily in a minion. But the idea of it doing it quickly is there, by the way. The whole thing is in speed. And you could argue one of the reasons of roasting a whole animal is it's quicker. Instead of having to cut it up and do all that kind of stuff, just shove us a, spit, um, a, a pomegranate wood into it and roast it, and everything is done quick. The matzo is done quick. You can cook this as a really quick meal. You know how they do those books of quick meals. So there's a quick meal you can do. And the idea is that the whole idea is that you're on the move. You're about to leave. And if you eat it in that way, so it could be. But I'm, I'm, I think it's, I'm not sure it's communal like community that we have. I think it's about households getting together. Le veto, le vetum, I think is the key there. Okay. And there, by the way, everybody matters. You think about this, by the way, why is it men, women and children? Because everyone eats it. Everyone who bites into it is buying into their freedom. It's not being led by the men. In a minyan, it's the men or the chazan or the lane or the rabbi. If everyone bites in, there's an equality there. Everyone's involved about in, in about this event. Yes, the man organizes it, but every single person has to eat this. So it's a very um, equalizing tradition. And everyone who bites into it, buys into it. With the experience, you see what I'm saying? It's really interesting as an idea. And then, and then you could eat so, the back quarter, I mean, the back end, because they didn't have the kashrut. You could eat. Oh, no, no, they had. Well, they, they, you, you had to try and get rid of as much blood as possible. The rabbis talk about how they would do those kind of things. And there's a way of porging the hinds, right? It used to be done. We don't have the synaptic nerve. That's taken off. That's Yaakov. That's all you before. But porging, they used to have a. I mean, they're very afraid of doing it in this country anymore. So for a time, there was that restaurant, that Argentinian. What was it called? El Gat. El, was it El Gaucho? Mm -hmm. Which had those special bits where the, the London Bedjan saw them out. But um, the idea of eating most of the bits is definitely possible of the animal. But it's the idea of that wholeness. You would have seen a whole animal, right? And I showed you that picture so that you go a bit. There were big, big, there were horrible pictures. There were more horrible pictures, by the way. But you look at it, you go, oh, because you see a head, you see legs, you see a body, and a child will look at it and see a life. When you see meat, you know, when you see a, you know, a chicken schnitzel, you don't think about life, right? But when you see a whole animal, you think about a life, and it's basically vicarious. It's you. You would have that image and that association. Uh, but, and and just to add as well, if I may, it, it, the timing of it is also essential because of it just before they left, meaning it was right before the end of the of the plagues. And you say like it's about buying their freedom. They physically had to do something in order to buy their freedom. Yes, yes. You, you couldn't just sit on the side. You see, in shul, you can sit on the side unless you're in a Sephardi shul, where you all got to join in. <laughs> right. But Ashkenazi shul, you sit on the side, you have a little chat, you leave. Ashkenazim, it's, look, it's hard being Ashkenazi. I'm, I'm sorry, I feel for you. But it's, you know, it's fine to get involved, but get involved. Right? It's my love used to say, stop being an observant Jew. Get involved. Stop observing. Get, get involved. Eat, drink, you know, do it. So Seder that's run by this guy in front and everybody else that's quietly bored is the reverse of what happened. Everyone's eating, everyone's talking at the same time, everyone's complaining and moaning and doing comparative high kind of stuff. That's what it's about. Lots of noise, everyone equally involved. It's such an equalizing thing. We can all eat, you know. Uh, yeah, I've got great memories of my daughter first ate duck. One of them's a one of them's a pescatarian going vegetarian. One really likes their meat, and we remember her when uh, she was even like a one year old taking bits of duck off my my wife's plate. Uh, early meat eater. Um, and and by the way, this is the only meat you need to eat in the whole year. 
right? Technically, you can be a vegetarian if you want to be. The only meat was this, because this was this action, Koba Pesa. And I think Rav Kuk and Rav said, even though they're vegetarians, the one bit of meat they would probably have would be this, because this has a power that's kind of beyond the issues of what you normally eat and stuff, for this symbolic idea of, of survival. And chicken soup. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Anyone yeah, any other but, questions? But, but if you want, if you want an example of slavery today, it's chickens, right? Yeah. There used to be maybe a couple of million. There's now 28 billion chickens on the planet. It's the most reproduced animal. It is, it is, it is, it is um, focused and reborn and bred just to be eaten by us. And most chickens live on the size of an A4 piece of paper. So the biggest slave animal today, if you research it, is probably the chicken. So uh, that's why you Ashkenazim have it on the Seder night. Uh, sorry. Actually, you, just, you realize I'm being playful about being Ashkenazi. A, a lot of people, I don't, but a lot of people eat tongue on on, on Seder night. Really? It's because because uh, of the whole not roasting thing. So as Ashkis, not only not we should we the halakha, the minhag is not only should we not eat lamb, we shouldn't eat any roasted meats. No roast chicken, no roast yeah, beef. Yeah. Okay. On okay. Night. In, in, I thought in, the lamb case... was because of the you've got you got to speak it. So it's like <laughs> talking. Uh, no, Ashkenazim, they get very, yeah, Ashkenazim have these hang ups. It's okay, yeah. Mark. I forgive you. I forgive uh, you. Uh, it, listen, it, they, didn't, they didn't ask me. It's above my yeah. pay grade. But because of that, to, to not get confused, they boil tongue. And yeah, they, no, they, no, uh, no, they, no, that's the main reason for Aliyah now. So you can marry Sephardim and then and eventually we'll wipe out this Ashkenazi weirdness. That's, that's the long term aim. <laughs> Careful of, now. I, I think you've got a uh, question coming from the. Yeah, also, yes, go on. Up to you. Um, you were saying about goats. Is there any re Is it just cost that we don't have goats? Because the Muslims still are really into eating their goats. Oh, no. Jews ate goats for years. Look it yeah, up. So in Europe, they did. We just don't now because it's not uh, attainable in the same kind of way. And there's not as much meat on it. It doesn't cook as well, all that kind of stuff. But if you were poor, Arthur, you had it. Absolutely. Okay. So, the, you know, it's, it's just that we don't get it. But if you, if you ordered it, you could order it. Absolutely. 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 Um, I know it's weird looking at this stuff, and I'll give you the handout, but I want you to think we're taught a kind of secondhand Judaism. And it feels like that. When you look at the original sources, <clears throat> they're so tasty. They're so juicy. They're so full of meat that you get impassioned by it. And that's what I'm trying to do for you. And I'm using the language on purpose, right? So I want you to kind of, you know, get, get a taste for this stuff. Um, are we done? Any other comments? That's wonderful. Thank you very much. A huge round of applause and immense appreciation to Rabbi Dr. Rafi Zarum. Can I, can I, can I mention one more thing, um, Rabbi Levine? I'm going to send to you. I've written a little booklet for Seder this year. It's called uh, Recovering, seven ready to go readings um, to help you on the road to recovery after the pandemic. Pesach is the metaphor of going from slavery to freedom, from darkness to light. And we are on that journey now, coming out of lockdown gradually. So I've written some readings that can parallel to, I'm gonna email the PDF to Rabbi Levine. It was in the JC on Shabbat, but this is a more easy on the eye version. And if you're happy to send it out, Rabbi Levine, it's free, you can print it, whatever you want, and you can use it as readings for Seder night if you want. As a, as I'm a happy to send out the PDF. I'm not happy to send the JC out. <laughs> no, no, fair enough, no, no, no. You can send the link, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> no, for <please. laughs> You know, we have standards. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's called Recovering. It's like the book that I did on Beyonding for Rosh Hashanah, but it's just free. You can just print it out and use it for Seder night if it's interesting for you. But anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, we thank appreciate you. it once again. A huge round of applause. I can see them all nodding and uh, and in agreement. Look at that. Uh, okay, a silent round of applause. Have you have a lovely, lovely Seder night. Hope you make it out of Egypt. And I'll see you on the other side. We'll, we'll, see, you at, we'll see you at the Kotel. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Amen. 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 Don't Amen. forget next Wednesday, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rafi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace and love. You.